everyone. Welcome. Thank you all for being here. Uh, some of most, many of you we know, a few new faces here, so we're happy that each of you came here this evening. Um, my name is Penny Wright, and um, we have a guest tonight whom uh, many of you have heard, in, in fact, quite a number of times. Uh, Martin Levinson is the moderator of our Great Decisions series. And what we did was we printed out several of the upcoming programs for you to peruse or take home. We do hope you'll join us for some of these. Um, they are held on Mondays, once every month or two, and they're on subject of a uh, subject of you know global importance. So take a peek at those afterwards. And, and we have a bunch of things going on, as, as you know. But one of the things I just thought I'd mention that's coming up that's lots of fun, and people who come really have a good time, is that we've started doing these kind of quiz evenings called Battle of the Brains. But the good thing is um, that you're seated at a table with three other people, so the tables of four. If you come with nobody else, we'll put you at a table. The really nice part is that you don't have to say anything out loud, and if you don't know that much, that's fine. We give you a piece of paper, and the whole group comes up with one answer for each question. So it, it's a little bit more fun and less pressureful than some uh, similar evenings. And we serve pizza and a really nice salad. So do come to that. The next one is April 29th. But I think we'll go ahead and get started today. I'll just tell you a couple of things about Martin Levinson. Uh, he holds a PhD in organ organizational studies from NYU. He's the author of nine books on topics that range from academic research on drug problems and policies to social satire. He worked as a school teacher and school administrator and is currently the president of the Institute of General Semantics, a think tank based in New York City. He's also a member of the Authors Guild, the National Book Critics Circle, and is the book editor for Etc., a review of general semantics. And I believe I, it's been two or three years since Marty started moderating our Great Decisions series. Um, since his boyhood days in Brooklyn, which he chronicled in a, in a book that we have here at the library, uh, Marty has lived in New York City and also on Long Island. And we're delighted to have him as our friend Please welcome Martin Levinson. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, so tonight we're going to be talking about Vietnam. Uh, the plan is to show a little bit of a video, a History Channel video. I'll only show about five or six minutes, just to give you the feeling to get back into that era. I suspect many of you lived through that era, as I did. And then I'll talk a little bit about it, and then I'll give you time for questions. So let's get started with the video. <laughs> Yeah. 
we today have concluded in Britain to end the war and bring peace and honor to Vietnam. Chi Minh uh, now Ho Chi Minh wasn't always a communist. Uh, 
he actually just wanted independence. And after World War I, he was a leader of the independence movement. He went to Woodrow Wilson, remember the Treaty of Versailles from history class in World War I? And he tried to get an appointment with President Wilson to plead the case that Vietnam should be free, should be made a democracy. But Wilson didn't see him. Wouldn't see him. By the way, Wilson also didn't see Mao Zedong, who wanted to meet with him also. Mao became a communist. So did Ho Chi Minh. And so uh, Ho Chi Minh became a communist, and he was a communist all through 1920s, 1930s. In the 19, late 1930s, Japan invaded Vietnam. And Ho Chi Minh fought against the Japanese. So he was our ally against the Japanese. And after the war in 1945, he said to the Americans, look, I'm an ally. We fought. We fought with you. Now we'd like our independence. And he was quoting from the Declaration of Independence to the Allied forces. Well, that didn't work because the French did not want to give the Vietnamese independence, and the Americans, our side, didn't want to cross the French. So we basically allowed the French to keep it, and the French fought there uh, from 1945 to 1954. There was an insurrection between the Vietnamese and the French, and in 1954, the French lost the famous battle known as Dien Bien Phu. Uh, it was an interesting battle because the French set it up, so they thought they were entrapping the Vietnamese to attack them, and they thought they could beat the Vietnamese in a, in a large-scale uh, military action, and the Vietnamese turned the tables because they were able to take artillery and pull it through the jungle, and anyway, they defeated the French at Dien Bien Phu, and the French had to leave. And when the French left, de Gaulle, who was the leader of France, said to Eisenhower, who was our president at the time, he said, don't be involved with Vietnam because it's a bad place to be involved with. You should just let it go. But Eisenhower didn't want to let it go because, well, you guys know this from the 50s. So what was the big scare in the 1950s? Communism. Communism. Remember the take cover drills in school? I don't know, it wasn't in public school. Take cover. You all went under the desk in public school, or you went against the wall like this, because the worry was, in case the Russians sent over a nuclear bomb, well, I was in New York, it could have been anywhere, but New York was pretty, were pretty scared. The idea was you'd be protected if you were under your desk. <laughs> I was a school administrator. I know the idea is you got to cover yourself. So we had a policy in place as administrators, but it's insane. Obviously, that wouldn't happen. But the point is, there was tremendous fear in the 1950s of communism. Such a fear that in the 1950s, there was the highest amount of church attendance per decade, I think, ever since they measured that. People just go to church, a lot of science fiction movies, because people were interested in that. But in any event, big fear of the McCarthy era, big fear of communism. So Eisenhower did not want to give up Vietnam because of something that he uh, came up with a theory known as the domino theory. And the domino theory was that any country that becomes communist threatens the next country. And then that country threatens the next country. And so soon, these countries will all become communist or fall like a row of dominoes. And that was the domino theory, which was very prevalent in the 50s. So Eisenhower felt he got to stay in Vietnam. And he put in advisors into Vietnam, not fighting soldiers, but advisors to advise the Vietnamese. Now, who was he advising? Well, after 1954, when the French lost, they divided Vietnam into two parts. The northern part, which Ho Chi Minh was the leader of that part, and the southern part. And the treaty basically said they were going to have elections in two years to decide the fate of the countries. Would they come together? What would happen? Now, if they had the election, what would have happened is they would have come together as one country because it was a great majority wanted to unite the country. But the United States didn't want to do that. So we installed a leader who didn't want to do that, and we, they never had elections. And the excuse was, well, you can't have elections because South Vietnam didn't sign the treaty because they weren't the nation at the time the treaty was signed. So basically, there was no uh, there was no elections, and so you had two countries: South Vietnam and North Vietnam. And South Vietnam was run by a Catholic, even though it's a Buddhist country, which later created some problems. So if you remember the monk that burned himself, the very famous uh, picture, 
It was the monk who self-immolated himself because the, he felt so many bad things were happening to the Buddhists in South Vietnam. And it was. So you had a sort of a minority religion running the country in South Vietnam. A lot of the people in South Vietnam weren't all that hep on defending the country. Whereas in the North, you had ideologues that really wanted to unite the country. So there was a rebellion. And the Viet Cong, I'm sure you've heard that term, the Viet Cong were the rebels in South Vietnam who were trying to overthrow the government. And in North Vietnam, by the North Vietnamese army, that would eventually come into South Vietnam to fight in the rebellion. OK, so uh, let me not get ahead of myself. Let's see where I am. Uh, all right, so now uh, let's go, let's fast forward to uh, the early 60s. Uh, Eisenhower leaves office. JFK comes in. Uh, Kennedy upped the amount of advisors we had in Vietnam. But Eisenhower is about 1,000, with Kennedy as getting closer to 1,600. Uh, but Kennedy, of course, was assassinated. And we don't know what would have happened had he lived. It's contradictory. He made contradictory remarks. Some remarks it looked like he wanted to pull out eventually. Other remarks, he really wanted to stay. I'm of the opinion he wanted to stay because JFK was a staunch anti-communist. His whole family was. Uh, remember Bobby Kennedy? Bobby Kennedy worked for Joseph McCarthy. JF, when the Congress censured, when the Senate censured Joseph McCarthy, JFK didn't vote against McCarthy. He just never showed up to vote because he was very friendly with McCarthy. Not so much that he liked McCarthy personally, but basically because McCarthy was an anti-communist and the Kennedys were strongly anti-communist. So I'm thinking if JFK had not been assassinated, there's a good chance he wouldn't have pulled out, but we really don't know. But he was assassinated, and what president took his place? Right, LBJ. Uh, except for the Vietnam War, LBJ probably would have been known as one of the greatest American presidents. He came in with the great society. I mean, he did amazing things domestically. Medicare, uh, Education Acts, Civil Rights Act, and tremendous stuff. And he would have had a wonderful legacy what kills it is Vietnam. I do a lecture on presidents, presidential rankings, and he's always ranked kind of in the middle or maybe even lower. But without Vietnam, he would have been top 10 easy. All right, so anyway, the first year he doesn't get involved with Vietnam, but who does he run against in the first election when he first has to run for president? Barry Goldwater. Mm -hmm. Barry Goldwater is a hawk, and Johnson doesn't want to look weak. So Johnson also says, well, I'm going to go, you know, I'm just as strong as you are. Not exactly. Barry Goldwater, remember the mushroom ad? Yeah. yeah. So I don't think uh, he wanted to drop a bomb. But in any event, um, LBJ wanted to show his strength. So in 1964, you probably remember this, in August 1964, there was a destroyer. The destroyer Maddox was doing a patrol, and they claimed they were fired on by the North Vietnamese. That was on August 2nd, while doing an um, intelligence patrol. Now, they fired back, torpedo boats fired on them, they fired back. A few days later, on August 4th, it looked like it was a subsequent attack. Now, in retrospect, that attack probably didn't happen. What happened probably was the fellow who was doing radar on the Maddox got confused, and it looked like an attack, but it really wasn't. That's one thing. The second thing, what was the Maddox doing so close to Vietnamese waters? And one of the reasons they were there was we were helping the South Vietnamese in the fight against the North Vietnamese. So arguably, we were even doing things that you could say the North Vietnamese needed to defend against. But in any event, because of these two attacks, Johnson ordered bombing of North Vietnam. And that was the start basically, of the, uh, of the Vietnam War for us. I mean, when we sent soldiers in. We then sent soldiers a few months later into Da Nang to guard the airfield. The Marines landed, and that was pretty much the start of the war. Now, it's a proxy war, meaning one of the reasons why we never fought directly China or Russia was we fought these proxy wars, like in Korea, right? We didn't fight directly, but the Chinese sent, well, actually, there yeah, we did fight the Chinese. 
but arguably we weren't fighting China directly, and the Russians didn't fight directly. Vietnam, the same thing. The Chinese were giving support, but we weren't fighting directly. But it's a proxy war. Okay, we have five allies in the Vietnam War. Who are the allies? Australia, New Zealand, Thailand, Philippines, South Korea. Not Britain, not France. They felt it was a loser, and it was. The media got very much involved in the war. As you know, uh, you watch television at night. Uh, Marshall McLuhan called it the living room war because at night you could see the reporters were there and they would televise it. Um, Johnson called CBS because he was angry at the way they were, broadca they were broadcasting the war. He called CBS the communist broadcasting system. So Trump wasn't the only one who's been against the media. Uh, Johnson also was against the media, as far as that goes. Through the television war, Martin Luther King came out against the war. Uh, McNamara, who was the Secretary of Defense, had doubts. Here's a good movie you might want to see. I thought McNamara did a good job in trying to portray his confusion over the war, although I don't think he was all that confused. But if you uh, haven't seen it, I recommend The Fog of War. Very good movie. It's on DVD. It's McNamara explaining what he did in Vietnam. Anyway, he had his doubts. There was an anti-war movement that then sprang up. Um, and of course, there were uh, protests in the street. You saw some of it. I mean, uh, people now say the country's divided. You know, we're in tribes, Trump, and the Democrats, the progressives, etc. And people go, wow, it's such a mess. Chaos. Remember the 1960s? Bigger mess. I mean, I think so. I mean, the people were people were running out of the country. The 30,000 who fled to Canada was part of it. Other, other guys were like faking it, not because there was a draft. Uh, Johnson took the draft because he couldn't seem to get enough soldiers. Although, two-thirds of those who served in Vietnam were volunteers. So it really wasn't a draft army. But in fact, uh, there were draftees who had to serve. Uh, many were able to get out of it for different reasons. I think if you went into uh, teaching in poor neighborhoods or disadvantaged neighborhoods, that was one way to get out. Trump had bone spurs, so he, <laughs> he got out, etc. So there's a lottery, and uh, so that's what happened. Uh, but in any event, um, it, was a, it, was a bit, it was a tough war because um, we said we would, an army typically tend to fight the last war. So we sent basically massive amounts of soldiers in, and we're hoping to confront massive amounts of soldiers back. But it was a guerrilla war, and it's tough to win a guerrilla war because the guerrillas who are against you don't stand and fight. They do hit and run. They attack, and then they disappear. And they don't fight in large numbers. So had they fought in large numbers, we would have easily won the war. But they didn't, and it was difficult. And also a lot of the troops there really you know, World War II, I do lectures on that. World War II is considered the last good war by many people. And one of the reasons it's considered the last good war is because the whole country was united in fighting the war. I mean, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, it was clear who the enemy was. And the Germans declared war against the United States four days later, so you knew who the enemy was. And Vietnam was tricky. I mean, the Vietnamese, the soldiers all look alike. Uh, and people of the soldiers, many soldiers were upset. I mean, a lot of civilians were killed. Uh, there was my lay with uh, Cali in the platoon where they, uh, they slaughtered civilians in a village. Uh, so that was, that was sad. I mean, there's always atrocities in war. In any event, um, it, was, it was difficult. And uh, then there was the Tet Offensive in 1968. Do you recall the Tet Offensive? That was one of the big turning points because there, the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, attacked in numbers. And although we were pelts, we won the, we, by the way, we won every battle in Vietnam. The military will tell you that. In every, in every battle, we prevailed. The problem is, we lost the war. So um, had, they, had they just kept fighting, eventually, maybe, we would have wiped them out, but I doubt it. Because they were really into it. As Ho Chi Minh said, you know, you can kill every 10 of us for every one of you that die, but we'll still, to the last person, keep on fighting. And it's tough to beat an enemy like that that has had such will. 
And then in the United States, when you had the demonstrations, the country was divided, so we didn't have the same will. So that was difficult. So anyway, in the Tet Offensive, um, basically, uh, we won the battle, but on television, it looked bad. Now, Walter Cronkite, remember Walter Cronkite? There was the, a whole country. He was the most trusted man in America. That was, they did a poll. Uh, who in the media today is the most trusted person? Depends on your party. But both Republicans and Democrats believe that Cronkite was the most trusted man in America. Now, Walter Cronkite said he felt we couldn't win the war. He felt it would be a draw. There was no way we'd win the war. And public opinion, which at that point was sort of 50-50, really turned against Johnson. And at that point, Johnson felt he couldn't run for re-election because there were so many people against him. So we went on TV one night and said, I'm not going to run. And other candidates got in the race. The first candidate was Eugene McCarthy. Probably remember him. And then Bobby Kennedy got in the race, which annoyed McCarthy. But in any event, he got in the race, and uh, of course, he was assassinated. Um, in any event, uh, who ran against, uh, who was the Democratic candidate who took Johnson's place in the next election in 68? Hubert Humphrey. Poor Hubert. Hubert Humphrey was Johnson's vice president, was being groomed to run in 1972 because everybody thought Johnson would run and win in 68. But because Johnson dropped out, Humphrey was sort of the sacrificial lamb, and uh, he ran against Richard Nixon. Yeah. So Richard Nixon came back, and Richard Nixon took advantage of what was going on, and then Richard Nixon became president. And what was his Vietnamese policy? Well, Nixon said we could have peace with honor. And um, Nixon did something that was really uh, bordered on treasonous, actually. Uh, before he was president, Johnson, before Nixon was president, Johnson was negotiating with the North Vietnamese about making some sort of deal. And Nixon got to the North Vietnamese, I'm sorry, the South Vietnamese and the North Vietnamese to make some sort of deal. And Nixon got to the South Vietnamese and said, don't make the deal so quickly. Wait till I'm president, be a better deal. But he shouldn't be negotiating if you're a candidate, but he did. Okay, so uh, Nixon comes in, um, the draft, well, in 1969 that there was a draft lottery based on a person's birth, and then in 1969, <coughs> Nixon started bombing Cambodia, because the Vietnamese, there was something called the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which was how the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, were getting to South Vietnam through the jungle, these jungle roads, and they were cutting through Cambodia to get to uh, South Vietnam, so Nixon said, we've got to bomb Cambodia. And it was a secret bombing. Henry Kissinger was the one who thought of the idea. And he won a Peace Prize, Kissinger, uh, in 1975 for, uh, for uh, peace in Vietnam. And uh, even though he was the one who authorized the secret bombing. And uh, Tom Lehrer, who was a songwriter at the time, said when he won the Nobel Peace Prize, he said, satire died when Kissinger won the Peace Prize. Because Kissinger was you know, so much involved in the war. Anyway, in 1970, remember Kent State? Five, five college students were killed. Uh, the country's very divided. Uh, Nixon was against the anti-war movement, talked about the silent majority. Remember, we went on television, sort of was dividing the country with that. Uh, South Vietnam invaded Laos in 1970. The invasion was a failure. Uh, the Paris Peace Accords happened. The war was over in 1973. It was peace with honor. Uh, there was the Nixon Doctrine after we left, that we're not going to throw troops at the problem. We had something called Vietnamization, where we turned the country over to them. And two years later, in 1975, Vietnam fell. The famous picture of the helicopter by the embassy pulling people out. Uh, in 1973, also the War Powers Act came into being. That's the act that says Congress has the right to not only declare war, but uh, the president needs to come to Congress when we fight, and presidents routinely don't do it even now, but the Congress hasn't stepped up and said that's wrong. So Nixon resigned in 1974. In 1975, South Vietnam fell. And who was the president after Nixon? Ford. Gerald Ford. So Ford came in and 
there was peace in Vietnam. Um, and then we went to something that was called the Vietnam Syndrome, where uh, the country was hesitant after Vietnam to get involved in wars, in military conflict. Also, there was a lot of drug use in Vietnam because um, the troops uh, were confused in many ways about what they were fighting for. Uh, a lot of insubordination among the troops. There was something called fragging, where um, if a superior, like an NCO or an officer, gave a command that the troops didn't like, uh, fragging is where you take a fragmentation grenade and you kill your own leader, your NCO or officer. And there were documented cases of that, where they were you know, killing their own officers, our, our side. Anyway, the war was over, the Vietnam Syndrome happened. Eventually, the Vietnam Syndrome sort of dissipated. Remember when Reagan invaded Grenada? That was one of the ways that we had a military victory there. Um, OK. I wanted to leave enough time for questions about, uh, about, about the war, because I know most I mean, all of you probably lived through it. So I'm going to stop now and ask if you have any questions or comments. I have an interesting question. Yes. What absolutely. about the role of Brown and Root? The role of? Brown and Root. The, the, the military contractor that was so tied to Johnson through the Browns. And, uh, you know, they ended up building all the bases in Vietnam on a no, on a no bid basis. We, we spoke before. You're from Texas. And they're from I Texas. Am. Right. They're from Texas, right? Not originally, but I'm from Texas now. Right. right. We knew yeah. all about Brown and Root. And right. We always were questioned what was going on. If you read the Johnson, Biography, Robert Carroll's biography of Johnson, you see the power of the Browns. They really contributed strongly to Johnson and to politics uh, because of all oil money. Back in the 30s, they started really, really running the country. That's my view. And the view of many Texans. <laughs> that's interesting. No, that's, that's fair. By the way, good for you for reading the uh, Carroll may be coming out with another, uh, the last book on Johnson. So he, his whole life is reading about uh, Johnson. Uh, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, clearly, whenever the country goes to war, uh, there are businesses that do very well. Uh, I mean, Dick Cheney worked for Halliburton. Uh, in the Iraq War, Halliburton did pretty well. Uh, if Carroll documented it, I'm sure there might have been something there. I don't think, though, that Johnson would have really done the war just for money. I think he really wanted a legacy. Uh, you know. L JFK wanted the Civil Rights Act to pass and eventually. Uh, well, even when he was president, he didn't come to the office. JFK is considered a liberal by many people, but he really wasn't. He was very conservative in tax policy. I mean, to this day, uh, much more conservative than most people, than most Democrats. Uh, he really didn't want to uh, have anything to do with race relations. His brother Bobby basically shamed him into it and eventually came to the idea that we could, should pass the Civil Rights Act. But the Congress would never pass the Civil Rights Act. Because he died, Johnson was able to get the Civil Rights Act passed because there was such feeling in the country for JFK, it was easier to pass the Civil Rights Act. And I think JFK was more interested in legacy than in you know, making a lot of money, although obviously everyone's interested in making money. But uh, I think he was more interested in the legacy. He had a great legacy there. But I'm sure many businesses profited. Same thing in World War II. I mean, my father was one of the things that he was an auditor. And he would come home when I was growing up and tell me stories of how businesses tried to rip off the government during World War II. And how uh, well, my father was a great hero in these stories. But, okay. But in any event, uh, yeah, so business will, many businesses profit during war. And we really don't know the exact connections between politicians, and et cetera. But I don't think that was maybe a primary reason. It might have been a secondary reason. I don't know. Um, Marty, could you talk a little bit more about the Tet Offensive? Yes. OK, so the Tet Offensive was this uh, 1968 um, offensive where the North Vietnamese and uh, the Viet Cong decided to throw as much as they could <clears throat> at the South Vietnamese to see if they could really make an impact. So, so they did. In 1968 is really one of, one of the important years because, um, as I said, with the Tet Offensive, originally it looked like, it looked very bad. I mean, the TV uh, images that were coming back to the country, you watch on television, 
It looked horrible that we were losing the war. But then our military regrouped, and we were able to throw the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese back, and the Viet Cong dispersed into the jungle. Uh, but as I said before, Walter Cronkite and many of the uh, reporters who were there felt you're not going to win a war. They could see that how idealistic the enemy was, uh, which is interesting. I, uh, I went to a lecture about a year ago, and the guy was saying, well, you know, we lost, and the guy was very uh, conservative, fine. He said, you know, we lost the Vietnamese War. If Eisenhower had been in charge, we wouldn't have lost the Vietnamese War. So, you know, so to, why was that? He said, well, if Eisenhower was in charge, we probably, if we thought we were losing, we might have threatened to use nuclear weapons. Well, okay. So MacArthur did that in Korea. Against, he wanted to actually talk to Truman, you know, it gets bad, we can use nuclear weapons against China. And it was an option, and Truman fired MacArthur, basically killing Truman's political career because MacArthur was very popular. Uh, but this fellow was saying, you know, also we didn't throw in enough troops into the war. Well, let me show, tell you how many troops we, we threw in into the war, because that's an interesting comment that he made. So in 1963, let me see if I go before that. Okay, so in 1962, the military advisors of Vietnam went from 700 to 12,000. That's a big range, right? In 1963, there were 15,000 advisors. Now remember, these advisors aren't directly fighting in combat. They're just helping the South Vietnam, South Vietnamese military with advice. Uh, in 1965, when we started fighting, 200,000 American troops. 1966, 400,000 troops. In 1967, 500,000 troops. In 1968, 540,000 American troops. Now, I guess if you put in 2 million troops, maybe you could put the insurrection down. The problem is it's a guerrilla war. So in a guerrilla war, it's like this war on terror. We're always going to be fighting. And did we always want to be fighting in Vietnam. I mean, I guess if you put in two million troops, you might have won. But also with a country, this country, have allowed a president to put in two million troops. I mean, would, would that be pretty much the end of his political career? There was so much um, dissent against that. Although, polls at the time showed more people wanted to fight in the Vietnam, not personally, but wanted America to keep on going than to pull out. There really was a silent majority. It just wasn't big enough. But I don't think, I think you basically, uh, I don't see that we would have won. But I mean, you can make the argument. One of the reasons I like history so much, uh, when you go back, is you can make all kinds of arguments. You just, you don't know what will happen. You have to really, you know, talk about what happened in history. But the fun part is, what if this happened? What if this would have happened? What if that would have happened? What if JFK was not assassinated? What if Johnson decided not to send troops in? What if Eisenhower listened to De Gaulle and said, you know what, let Vietnam be their own country? Maybe we could have made a deal and said to Ho Chi Minh, have your own country, but we don't want it to be communist. Because Ho Chi Minh really was more of a nationalist than a communist. He wasn't one of these communists, like he wasn't like, like Stalin, or he wasn't like Lenin, or he wasn't like Marx. He just wanted to have his own country. And he might have made a deal not to be so pro-communist if we would have said, okay, you could be a national, you can have the country, you're a national country. But we were worried that it would be communist, and as I said, the 50s were a bad time. A um, couple other things after the war, uh, a few things. Of course, there was a war memorial built, the Vietnam War Memorial was built in 1982. Uh, in 1984, there's something called the Weinberger Doctrine. Remember Casper Weinberger, Secretary of Defense? And he said in, in this doctrine, we would commit troops only if the U.S. had a vital national interest. This was the fallout from Vietnam. We would commit troops fully with an intention of winning. We would have to have clearly defined military and political objectives and a capacity to accomplish those objectives and we would reassess and readjust in an ongoing manner, have a reasonable assurance of support of Congress and the U.S. public, 
and the commitment of troops only as a last resort. Well, that sounds real good. And actually, arguably, um, when Bush went into Iraq, some of those things were there. I mean, although, what was our vital national interest in Iraq? Huh? We did have an intention of winning. We really had military and political objectives, and we, in Iraq, we satisfied those objectives. It wasn't that we couldn't beat the Iraqis. It was that after we beat them, we didn't really know how to handle it. Um, reasonable assurance of support of Congress. Bush did have support of Congress in the beginning. Commitment of troops only as a last resort. That you could argue. Uh, anyway, the Bush Doctrine, which came after the Weinberger Doctrine, was preventive war. In other words, you go to war to prevent things that will be worse. And unilateral action. When uh, George, the son, George W. Bush, went into Iraq, he didn't have a lot of allies, unlike his father who did the first Iraq war, the Gulf War, where the UN came in and we had tons of allies, including Arab states. Uh, the Sun didn't have that. Uh, then there was the Powell Doctrine. Remember Colin Powell? The Powell Doctrine was based on the Weinberger Doctrine and is based on overwhelming strike capabilities. And you know, we've got a great military. I mean, a very strong military, stronger than many of the other countries combined below it. So the idea is when you go to war, you go with such force that there's almost no chance of losing. That's basically the power of doctrine. And another thing that came out of the Vietnam War was the Pottery Barn Rule. And the Pottery Barn Rule is if you break it, you own it. So if you go into a war and it doesn't work out, you're stuck. So you've got to be careful when you go into these wars. Now Johnson went into the war because he was also getting advice from people around him, like McNamara. And McNamara and some of the other advisors uh, were considered the, the brightest people, the elite. As a matter of fact, um, there's been a book, I hope maybe you've read, read the book, uh, The Best and the Brightest by David Halberstam. It's a wonderful book. And it talks about all these brilliant advisors from Ivy League schools who were in the government who were running the war. And they were running the war basically from offices using statistics. And they were having all the statistics in front of them. They were being fed to them. They were saying, well, based on these statistics, this is what we should do, et cetera, et cetera. And they basically and they screwed up royally. And part of the reason they screwed up is because what's the where do you get these statistics? Well, you get the statistics from the soldiers in the field. And the soldiers in the field knew that these policymakers wanted to have statistics and they wanted to make the world look good, so they lied about a lot of it. You know, it's like uh, I was in education when people think, well, you know, teach to the test, teach to the test. There's a lot of cheating that goes on when you just make people's livelihoods or profession based on a test. And so they were getting following statistics, and also they're making bad decisions. And these were the brightest people. That's why the book is called The Best and the Brightest. And they were giving Johnson advice. And he was taking this advice. I mean, he, didn't, he wasn't a general. He didn't really know what was going on. And also the general in charge at the time, General Westmoreland, uh, was talking about how you know, he could win the war. And he kept saying, the way to win the war, I need more troops. I need more troops. And no matter how many troops were sent over, he always needed more troops. Well, all the general, any general needs more troops. The Civil War, General Meade in the Civil War, uh, need more troops, they need more troops. Yeah, I mean, how many more troops should we send you? But in any event, it's a wonderful book, and it just goes to show you that even the, the top people, they didn't go there. They really, what they really should have done, in my opinion, why not? I studied, I can give an opinion. Uh, they should have gone to the Indiana and talked to the, not to the generals, but to the privates, to the corporals, to the pilots, the people in the field. They would have got a much, also to some of the people in the South Vietnamese Army. They would have gotten a much better feel for what was going on. I mean, if you're really not there, and you're just, you know, in your office in Washington, you know, drinking coffee, eating Danish, and looking at statistics, you don't really get a good feel for it. But, you know, look, it's a, you know, the generals aren't running the war, it's the politicians, and they do it, and the generals really didn't do that great a job in the war. At least Westmoreland didn't. Um, Hill argued he didn't have enough troops. <coughs> but, 
by the people of Oregon. Um, any other questions? Yes. Why do the Americans support the South Vietnamese governments, whoever was in power, when they were so blatantly corrupt. And the Americans never, as a policy, never really won the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people in South Vietnam. So there was no groundswell of supporting American troops, as far as I can. I'm reading a book about Vietnam. Oh, good. And so much of what you're saying is true. But the, the incompetence and the lying and the the political decisions that were made rather than the military decisions were all a lot were based on lies. It's very it's just a horrible story about their involvement there. It is. And as far as the corruption that went on, the gov the South Vietnamese government was corrupt. We knew they were corrupt. As a matter of fact, Kennedy, um, the first leader of South Vietnam Vietnam, uh, okayed a coup against this leader. And the coup went on and he was killed. And the leader was a Catholic, and Kennedy was a Catholic, also felt very bad about that. He didn't want the guy killed, he just wanted him removed. He figured like any other good leader, he'd go you know, to some country and live it up with the money he stole from, the, from Vietnam, but he was killed. But yeah, it was corrupt, but what really made us deal with the corrupt regime was the fear of communism. I mean, even if they were corrupt, they were still fighting communists. And so, you know, we stayed there, and um, the people, now, there were South Vietnamese who really did want to fight for South Vietnam. That is true. But I guess person for person, they didn't have the idealism that the North had. And so that was tough. But you're right, the political decisions were bad. And the military decisions, although we won the battle, again, you're fighting a guerrilla army. That's a tough war to fight. You know, World War II, Eisenhower defeated the German army, an Italian army, but these were soldiers that fought big battles. We weren't going to get the big battles, so I think even if Eisenhower was the general, I don't see how he would have prevailed. But you can argue it. So, on the other hand, yes? Um, I have a question. I didn't serve in Vietnam, but I've, I was about three years short, and I've read a lot of books about it because I find it intriguing. I read A Bright Shining Lie by Neil Sheenan in retrospect. And I was a senior in high school, and he wants to serve. And the whole concept of obey orders yeah. scares me. And he's gotten accepted into the Naval Academy, and I think it's one but he wants to serve. Yeah. But um, I have my reservations, because I don't like the idea of obey orders. And I don't like what happened in Vietnam by guys like Chris Moreland, who lied. Uh, I mean, I would love to hear if there's any veterans here who have some insights for me for what to tell my son. Well, is there anybody here that served in Vietnam? I was in the lottery. So there, there is someone. Oh. No, there's someone. You served. Uh oh. I happen to be in the Tet Opera. I, I was a, a, a Marine platoon commander, company commander. Wow. I had to Case on a few other places. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there must be a lot of comments that are being made. And uh, we never faced anybody in pajamas. Uh, we faced NBA, mm -hmm. well equipped, yeah. best artillery in the world. Yeah. Uh, they had an Air Force that didn't attack us, but they attacked the planes that were bombing the night and the Yeah. Um, and uh, they were very, very good fighters. Very, very good fighters. Mm -hmm. We were better. Yeah. But uh, uh, it, was a, it was a tough war. Very tough war. That. Yeah. And actually, the veterans of the Vietnam War, in a way, uh, you know, they talk about the greatest generation in World War II, if you saw that on the tape. In many ways, the, the Vietnam veterans had a tougher time. Because when the veterans came back in World War II, there was a parade. Everybody loved the veterans. They fought the good war. Uh, people who fought in Vietnam, the soldiers fought in Vietnam, they would come back and often protesters would spit on them, would say, you know, baby killer, etc. So these folks who, you know, you really can never, I think, uh, blame the soldiers for and following orders. And by the way, I didn't serve, but you go into the military, you have to follow orders. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you, you can follow no orders choice. when you're in a job. Yeah. yeah. Whether you work at 18. Can I answer this question? Sure. I, I have a son who's a full colonel in the Marine Corps. 
mm -hmm. Silver Star recipient, Bronze Star with two Ds, uh, two Purple Hearts. I had another son who served five years in the Marines. Uh, all did combat tours. Our family went to four or five uh, deployments with our sons. Uh, but I saw a market change in my sons uh, having gone in. I don't know where in the Marines, but having gone in the military. And uh, I would have loved to see uh, one of my sons go to the Naval Academy, any of the academies, for no other reason than financial savings. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and and uh, you do you give them five years, so a total of nine years, and you get a job. Uh, Sure. So uh, I, I think it's an honored profession. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I spent 41 years in one company, uh, but before that I was in uh, five years in the military, and some of my proudest time was meeting those young Marines mm -hmm. uh, in the field of battle, and uh, and no one ought to take that away from us. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I mean, no one has to thank us. I mean, I was just uh, uh, really proud to do it. Where was that? Yeah. Where was that? Vietnam? Yeah, Vietnam. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, well, that's a better answer than I can give, but I didn't, sir. Well, actually, uh, that, that's, that's a great answer. Can I, and what, sure. what do you think, what do you think, I have my own opinion, sure. what do you think is the major reason for the social upheaval uh, in the 60s, 65 through 69? What, what, what would your opinion be the major reason? Well, it was the phase of 65. So from 60 to 64, it was about civil rights. Well, I'm, talk I'm talking once. 65 to 69. 65 to 70. Well, what happened, I think what happened is once the draft was in, you started drafting. It's one thing to draft working class people, but once you draft college people who really don't want to go, I think that was the real socialist people. Because the college, <coughs> many college people didn't want to go into the service. They, either, they felt the war, they couldn't see the purpose of the war, they never wanted to be in the military service, but I think basically they didn't see the purpose of the war. Um, and I think that was a lot of the stuff, that was, a lot of the protests that were going on had to do with that. Um, but it was civil rights and, and the other, and the, the ideas that you I, I, I agree, but the main reason, in my yeah. opinion, okay. is that LBJ, did not activate the reserves. Uh, he went to the, the draft instead. So the reserves became a haven for people who knew about it. That's true. Well place. That's true. First of all, there were columns of permits. I had one. That's true. Uh, uh, but and they shouldn't have existed. If you were a policeman, you got a deferment. There should, other than physical infirmity, right. there should have been zero deferments. No. And if they ever brought back the draft, which will never happen, it's political. No, no, no it'll, 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 never, yeah, it'll no. never happen. Okay. It's like attacking Social Security and Medicare. Uh, right. It's a third rail of politics. Yeah. It, it, it'll, it'll never happen. Uh, but there should have been zero deferments. Yeah. So the reserves became a haven and an escape clause for the well to do yeah. uh, uh, to, to go into. I know, because after I came back, I got out after five years in the Marines. Sure. Uh, I spent about three or four more years in the reserves. And it was an absolute joke. Yeah. Now, the reserves today are tight yeah. because they get activated. Yeah. They're very, very good. And yeah. they're, well, they're as good as the, the active duty personnel. That's interesting. No, I think that's an interesting well, look, look, George W. Bush was flying in Texas, so there you go. But yeah, I think that's a good point. Yes. I just wonder if you'd say more about why Johnson really stepped down. Kind of guy that he was at such amazing decision. I know there were ideas of his son in law as a fighting that whole thing. But he could have ended the war. He, to end his presidency when he was such an ambitious guy and handed over to Richard Nixon, who said, I'm going to end this war. Right. And one, I'm going to end this war. Johnson could have ended the war. Well, he, he, he wanted to. Well, he could have, but that's tricky. I mean, if you end the war so quickly, we lose. And you know, the theory is you don't want to lose faith. Anyway. We did, but you don't know that in advance. But uh, the theory is in wars, often people stay, well, the country stay because they don't, they don't want to lose states. So you're fighting basically to get out in a sort of dignified way. And by the time Johnson with the Ted Offensive, we were so far in, and the country had turned so much against Johnson. Now, if he pulled out, other people would have said, gee, we lost the war, you're pulling out, we should stay and really be victorious. They might have voted against him. So he was in a place where he really couldn't do anything. 
He would have lost the election had he run, and he knew that. So he got on TV, it was a painful decision. Got on TV and said, you know, one term, this is it. And he tried to negotiate, he really did. It was that last year, and Nixon sabotaged him. I mean, horrible. But it is what it is. But yeah, I think uh, he had to get out. Marty, did you uh, happen to see a film called The Last Days of Vietnam? Uh, I think I did. It was last year? Yeah, we, we shot it here at the library, and okay. I thought it was a really interesting film. And I think we have it for other people who might be interested. There's, there's good. Uh, Ken Burns did a documentary on the Vietnam War. You probably can get that one. Um, Stanley Carno, K-A-R-N-O-W. It's a wonderful book, Vietnam, A History, if you want to do that. It's a library. There are books. Uh, but, I mean, it's, it's just interesting to read. Uh, Lawrence O'Donnell did a book on 1968, just the year. It's a pivotal year in American history, not just the Vietnam War, but the Chicago riots of the Democratic Convention and the upheaval, give you a feeling for the time. Uh, it, should, it should be interesting, but uh, yeah. The other, yes? When was the beginning of the Vietnam War? Well, it's like, you know, I, do, I do a World War II lecture, and people say, when was the beginning of World War II? I mean, well, it's, well, the troops, the combat troops landed in 65. But, uh, you know, you could argue, well, you could argue 1945 was the beginning, in a sense, that the, the French were fighting. Uh, Eisenhower put in advisors in the 1950s. You could argue that was the beginning. Um, when the Maddox, when we bombed Vietnam after the Maddox, you could argue that was the beginning. Um, you can make up arguments. That, that's the interesting thing. And it's not like... Uh, I mean, I, I would argue it's probably the start of the Vietnam War was um, after World War I when Wilson didn't see Ho Chi Minh. <laughs> but I'm a historian, so I think that these things can go back. Had he seen him, no Vietnam War, easy out. But always in retrospect, it's always easy to argue looking, you know, hindsight's 2020. I'm not making the decisions, so I can be a genius. Because no, I can remember supporting uh, Da Nang from Japan in the uh, early 60s. Of course, I was in the military at that time. I didn't get a lot of the news while being in the military, what was going on yeah. with the war. We were just, and then I was deployed there in uh, summer of 65. Wow. So I never got to know when the beginning was, because we had, like I said, we had aircraft there in 62 and 365. Right. right. Well, I mean, arguably, you know, once the Marines landed in Da Nang after the Gulf of Tonkin incident, we had ground troops there who were fighting. They were guarding the bases, but they were really there to fight. And once ground troops were there, we kept getting more ground troops. And so, uh, they said by 68, we had 540,000 a lot of soldiers. And people, you know, a lot of people getting killed. And uh, Americans getting killed. And, uh, you know, families upset. Well, logically so, with no end in sight. So uh, it was a mess. But, uh, but and the soldiers would, you know, soldiers serve, you're a soldier, I mean, even if you protest, you're protesting the political decisions, not the soldiers. I mean, that was a total mistake. It was sad, I think. Well, you've been a good audience. Go get books on Vietnam. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marty. For those of us, and probably most of us are, some of us are, old enough to remember that time. It was interesting to revisit it. Thank you all for being here, and hope we'll see you at other programs. Thank you again.